I, no, recording has started, sorry. <laughs> a little voice in my ear. So, yeah, my name's Lewis Rogers, um, and I'm one of the authors of a new series from Macmillan. Um, it's an academic, academic English series um, focusing on reading and writing in one strand and listening and speaking in another strand. And there's five books in total in the series. Um, currently, levels one, two, and three are out, and the foundation and level four are coming out later in the year. I was on the level two, the yellow one, the reading and the writing there. Um, my background is uh, I taught um, English for a number of years um, abroad in Europe, mainly, basically. Uh, Italy, Germany, and Portugal. And since coming back to the UK, I've been working in uh, um, acad um, academic English, really, at Nottingham Trent, first of all, where I did my master's, and um, for the last seven years at the University of Reading. Uh, often when I, I used to go um, recruit students from the university abroad, and um, people always ask me if we had a university of writing as well. Um, but no, it is the University of Reading, not the University of Reading. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to look at academic vocabulary today here. It's going to be largely more theoretical talk, less about the, um, less about the books. It's not a sales pitch. Um, if you want to have a look at the books, there's lots of um, samples and PDFs and contents pages all available on the Macmillan Skillful website to take a look through. But this is more talking about some of the, the principles, really, that underlie the sort of selection or language that we have in the course. Um, so looking at, first of all, defining academic vocabulary, what do we mean by academic vocabulary? It sounds like a simple thing to define, but there are actually hundreds of definitions out there. I've just chosen a couple. Um, and looking at particular features that I think uh, make academic language different. <coughs> and I'm going to look at two of the sort of main general academic vocabulary lists, so ones that are considered transferable between disciplines, so not discipline specific, so not for science or for engineering or for business, but ones that cross the whole of sort of academic text. So they're the academic word list by Avril Coxhead and the academic keyword list um, from the University of Louvain um, by Magdalene Pacquel. And then after that, I've been looking at um, collocations, essentially, two to four word chunks. Um, and going a little bit more into discipline specific areas with that. But quite a lot of that's based on the work of um, Ken Highland. And the last section, really, is looking at vocabulary and reading. What impact does vocabulary have on reading? Um, and also a little bit of a psycholinguistic sort of um, process that goes on when people are reading. Um, and what kind of can happen, really, if we give students a, a text off level, not just short term, but long term. Um, OK, so yeah, just to have a look first of all, a couple of definitions of academic vocabulary. I'll just give you a minute or two to read through these. Exactly the sort of slide I always tell my students not to do, far too much text on the slide. The two, the two points I think that are sort of key for myself with these are in the first one there, uh, and the part in the first set of brackets defining the formality of tone, the complexity of content, and the degree of impersonality of stance. And then in the second definition there, um, facilitates communication and thinking about disciplinary content. So in both of those, I think the key thing is that uh, the vocabulary is actually carrying the, the thing that they're having to engage with, the thing they're having to study, possibly not quite in their discipline yet, maybe in sessionally, um, but for a lot of the um, cases, perhaps on a foundation program or on a pre-sessional summer course where they're having to get the level up to a sort of standard where they'd be accepted onto their degree. But it's still content driven. Um, sort of texts are chosen or written on the basis of the, the content more than the language. When you look at general English courses, uh, the, the texts are written to, to model particular structures or to model um, 10 items or to lead into a discussion, whereas for academic purposes, they might be chosen to model a particular structure, but largely they're there to, to drive the content, certainly once they get onto their degrees and their in-sessional programs. Um, some particular features about academic um, vocabulary, I think, that define it from um, general English, and this is a real benefit, so we have lots of people from all over the world, but anyone with a, 
a Latin-based language, um, uh, we'll probably look at um, a list like the academic word list and think, but these all have cognates in my own language. Why would I bother teaching them to students? Um, and to a certain extent, there, there's some truth in that. If we look at um, non-academic vocabulary, like the words there, eat and dine, right and correct, you often have a, a Germanic root word and a Latin root word in informal English. But a lot of um, formal vocabulary in academic writing, you, you don't have a Germanic equivalent. So take the word analyze. Um, in German, it goes back to a Latin root as well. Um, so you, you do find that's one particular feature. I do remember, actually, when I was teaching in Italy, um, even quite young teenagers writing with some very sophisticated vocabulary. And it was only when I realized that there was an incredibly similar word in, in um, Italian that the translation wasn't actually that complex for them. Um, Another feature I think that makes academic vocabulary stand out is that it's morphologically complex. There's a lot of affixes that are being added, prefixes and suffixes to, to change the form of the word. Um, another area is the type of words that are in there. So we find a lot higher proportion of nouns, adjectives and prepositions, particularly nouns to verbs. So if we look at um, academic texts, you find that you have uh, four nouns to every verb. Um, whereas in spoken English, you find that you have roughly one noun to every verb. So you, you're, carrying, you're carrying a lot more sort of emphasis on noun phrases, a lot less verb-driven clauses, much more noun-driven. So obviously changing again sort of the focus of even the, the grammar, not just the, the individual words we choose, but arguably you wouldn't necessarily be teaching the same tenses that you would because so much more is in the present simple or the past simple that you you arguably don't need to jump through the sort of uh, the past perfect continuous hoops and things to confuse the students. Um, grammatical metaphor, which largely sort of means uh, nominalization, um, is much more frequent and common. Uh, something that comes quite late to students, really, so much higher, higher levels where that starts to come into their own writing. Informational density, uh, the ratio of content words to the total words, so it carries a lot more meaning, again, coming from those sort of noun phrases. Um, you know, if you think of a, an abstract, there's obviously an awful lot of meaning, a summary of a 20,000 word document or something into 100, 150 words. Uh, students are always having, also having to deal with sort of abstract concepts more. Um, you know, something like respiration is actually sort of quite an abstract thing that they're having to get their, their minds around. These uh, two sentences here are two sort of examples which show a lot of those features uh, coming into play. So the first one um, in spoken English, just because people who read more read better doesn't mean that if you read more, this will make you read better. Um, as opposed to the correlation between the amount of reading and reading ability uh, does not imply a causal relationship. So you've got a number of the features I mentioned going on there to create this sort of more uh, academic style, this uh, academic voice that's coming through. So there's some of the sort of key sort of o overall areas of what makes academic language difference. There's a lot more out there. There's some very good books um, that go into obviously a lot more detail. Uh, for example, Biber has a very good study. So I have just noticed um, questions that come through in the chat that I'll try, I'll try to Sorry, someone's just told me they can't take it anymore because <laughs> I R uh, after any, every word. Sorry about that. I'll try to stop R. But if anyone posts any questions in here, I'll um, try to answer them. But they do tend to fly past quite quickly, so uh, I'll try and answer questions at the end. I'll also try to stop Ring now. Uh, okay. Um, so moving on. Uh, <laughs> thank you for those that said don't mind. <laughs> Uh, academic word list. So this is probably the most famous one um, that's out there in terms of general academic vocabulary. Um, it's been around for over a decade now, and you, you can find it in uh, over 20 books, I would say. Um, definitely over 20 books. And it's something that's also really pushed forward other sort of studies into vocabulary, creating more discipline-specific lists and other transferable lists. Um, so it was done by Avril Coxhead, and it was focusing on four discipline, four discipline areas, and 28 different subjects. 
It's a three and a half million word corpus and uh, has 570 word families within that corp within that that have been identified as being academic words. So when this list was created, they cut out the first 2,000, assuming that they were a high enough frequency that learners on a pre-sessional, for example, would already know those 2,000 words, then looked at creating a list that appeared in all of those discipline areas frequently enough to say that it wasn't discipline specific. That you could say it was a general academic word rather than an, an engineering word or a law word. And the idea is this then would give students a greater range of vocabulary to access the test, to text, sorry. Um, there have been some criticisms of the of the, um, the the list and the way the list has been used. One of the um, criticisms is it's based on West's general service list. So those 2,000 words that they're talking about are actually from a study in 1953. Um, and I think the word, even the word shilling is on that list, which is um, an old form of money that no longer exists in this country. About five or ten pence, I think it was. Um, and the purpose of creating this list was more to help students access reading texts. It wasn't looking to access le lectures or it wasn't looking to improve their writing. It was focusing more on improving their reading. The argument being that uh, with 2,000 words, a student would have around 75% of the text that they would um, understand. Giving them the academic word list gives them an additional 10 to 15%, um, meaning that they are then getting up to sort of 85, 90% coverage of the text, leaving them then to focus another 10 to 15% on specialist vocabulary, so related to the discipline field. One criticism of this list has been um, that some of the words are not necessarily what you would think would necessarily be an academic word, that some of them are too, are too general. If I could just ask you in the chat room to just type which of these eight words do you think would be academic? So just type into the chat room, which of these eight words would you expect to find on an academic word list? All of them, quantitative, qualitative, emission, all but job, everything except job, emission. Yeah, kind of intuitively, a lot of these words feel quite academic. Um, but when you look at the academic word list, only two of these words are on that list. So which two do you think it would be? Determine the quality of emission, determine examination. No, nobody's got it right so far, I don't think. No, no, yes, Ooh. job and emission, nearly. It's um, job and qualitative. They're the only two that actually appear on the academic word list, job and qualitative. The other words are largely not on the list because they're actually in the first 2,000 most frequent words in English. So uh, classification and determine are in the first 1,000. Examine, persuasion and emission come within the first 2,000. Quantitative is outside the 2000 and outside of the academic word list. I think it's about 4000 in frequency or something. Um, so the only two that actually appear on the academic word list based on the frequency are job and qualitative. So a lot of people um, consider, you know, like a word job, if you think about a book like, uh, um, you know, perhaps Global from Macmillan, I'm sure there's probably a unit um, in the elementary book on jobs. Um, perhaps teaching useful words like butcher and baker. And uh, the, some people have criticised it, saying that, in, that it doesn't feel intuitively that some of these words would be academic. If you had used the British uh, National Corpus as the one to define the most common words, which wasn't um, out um, in its complete extent when this list was created, job wouldn't be in it. Job would be too frequent in that list, so it wouldn't be on there. But it is on the academic word list. Some people would say, you know, why would you teach the word qualitative um, and not the word quantitative? It's intuitively, they go together. It would seem strange to teach one in isolation without the other. Um, so, yeah, there are some, it is, it is weird, the job is an academic one, yeah. Um, 
So that's one of the criticisms, that some of the words appear too too frequent. Another is that it doesn't really deal with multi-meaning words and how they, how they behave differently in different disciplines. So if we take the word volume, um, in science it's a, more typically used as the volume of liquid. But if we take the word volume in a social science, then it's more typically uh, a volume of a journal or the word attribute or attribute. Um, an attribute of a person um, is more common in the business science sort of field. Um, to attribute something is more common in the science um, area. These are, this all comes from Highland. The references are at the end of the, the presentation. So some people have argued that one core list is, is not possible that you need discipline specific lists because they behave differently in different areas. Um, other people have argued that you know, the word theory is theory no matter what the discipline. So there's both sides of the camp really with this one. So another criticism that comes out is that we should look uh, beyond individual words. So moving to collocations. Uh, and at collocation level, it also addresses, it changes the, the meaning and the use of some words. So the words at the bottom there, address, control, and means, are not on the academic word list because they're in the first 2,000. However, when you look at them in a collocation level, their use is probably not the most frequent use. So address an issue rather than the place where you live. Control group is another common academic collocation. And by means, meaning the way that which you do something. So taking up the collocation level can change the meaning, change the use. Also, when you look at collocations, oh, sorry, um, the idea of it being too general, I'm not sure if um, everybody knows this um, website, lextutor.ca. It's a website where you can put in a text to um, check the frequency of the, the words. So you can use it to possibly grade a text if you want to. It highlights which words are particularly infrequent. Um, or you can use it to find quite quickly which words. So you want to focus on the academic word list words. You can use it to focus in on those. So if you look at this here, you would imagine this was quite a typical academic text. 76% of the words come from the website, it's um, the one at the top there, www.lextutor.ca. You can do various different ways of analyzing the text. This one is using the 2,000 words and the academic word list. So 76% come from the first 1,000 words. Um, just under 4% come from the 2,000 words. And just under 10% come from the academic word list. So there's 90%. Um, it's kind of sort of level where you would assume it was a, an academic text, 10% AWL, 75% in the 2000. This text is actually this article. Um, I don't know if this paper is known outside of the UK particularly. It's a tabloid, um, tabloid newspaper, so not a particularly... Um, yeah, serious newspaper, it's, um, yeah quite basic. I think I remember being told at school you only needed a reading age of 11 to be able to engage with the sun. Um, so it's uh, not, some people say it, the words are actually too frequent, they're not academic enough because they appear with quite a high frequency in a general publication like the sun, for example. The list, though, has gone on to be, it has been used in numerous books. I do think it um, provides a good basis for students learning vocabulary. If you've got only eight weeks and you need to prioritize something, it gives a way of prioritizing the vocabulary. Um, and it has really gone on to uh, develop the whole area of academic corpora, really, and what vocabulary that we use and what we focus on and teach in the classroom. You know, the, the three lists I've given here are some that have gone on to be uh, specific to subject fields. Um, and it has really pushed sort of research into vocabulary um, and bringing it into the classroom in a principled way um, has much more come to the fore. Another one that has um, reached less published material so far, but um, is similar in the sense that it tries to create a general transferable list rather than a subject specific list is the academic keyword list. Um, this is from the University of Louvain. Uh, 
probably not right to do this on a publisher's talk, but this is the book. <laughs> it's at the end in the bibliography as well. Um, and it's an analysis of um, four different corpora, and one way it differs quite significantly, or a number of ways it differs, is um, it doesn't exclude high frequency words. The rationale being that they were looking more, I think, here to create a list that um, students could use to inform their own writing, so not just for reading. So the academic word list is looking more at giving students a vocabulary to access a text. Where the, and the argument here was that the academic word list would not necessarily help with productive skills um, like writing. So it does include high frequency words. It's uh, so the book again. Yes, sorry. <laughs> it is in the bibliography at the end, and I think the slides will either be emailed or the um, uh, talk will be put online. Um, it's now in paperback, fortunately, because until recently it was only in hardback, and it was um, about sixty pounds. Um, so paperback is only fifteen pounds, I think. So it's a, a bigger list. There's nine hundred and thirty words on the list. Uh, and another significant way that it um, varies is that it doesn't just analyse published academic texts. It also includes two corpora of student writing, British student, um, native speaker writing and international student writing. So it's using a different sort of source to create the corpora. You end up with quite a different list. So 50% of the words on this list are actually from the first 1,000 words. 97% of the list come from the first 2,000 and the academic word list, but only 37.5% are actually from the academic word list. So it actually um, includes a much, much higher proportion, um, around 60%, are within the first 2,000 words. If you used to remember the academic word list, um, the idea was that with those 2,000, it would give you 80, a student 80% coverage of the text. But here, it's not looking to increase coverage of the text. It's looking to improve students' use of vocabulary and prioritizing those words with the argument that the words behave differently in academic context sometimes um, and that students need to learn how to use those words in an academic setting, even though they may have a passive understanding and knowledge of it. I'll show you a little bit later in the talk as well. There's quite a, um, an interesting insight in the book as to how um, students over rely on a um, certain number of words um, and don't push themselves to use other words. And those words are actually quite high frequency words that they're not using. So it's that idea that they do still need to practice and they still do need to be engaged with these high frequency words because they're not using them in their own writing. A number of the criticisms of the academic word list are still applicable to the academic keyword list. If you're in the camp of transferability or specificity, that question is still there. It's still looking at transferability. It doesn't look at how they behave in different disciplines. It looks at how they behave in academia in general. So for those who like to fall down on the side of the argument of we should be doing sort of specific academic English course in medical English, then this would not be sort of the appropriate list necessarily. Um, personally, I think arguably you need both at different stages. Um, they had the Barleap conference in um, the UK last weekend. It's an association for lecturers in EAP. And um, in one talk they were talking about more about sort of some of the um, uh, common things that we teach students, like thesis statements and topic sentences, and how there's quite a lot of um, research that shows that they're not often that frequent. But the presenter was saying that you kind of need to learn the rule of thumb before you can learn how or when to break the rules. And I kind of think a similar argument can be said here. You need the transferable vocabulary first of all, and later perhaps the specialised vocabulary you get nearer, perhaps supporting your course as you're doing it or in the final weeks before going on to the course. Um, but also people switch um, disciplines a lot and then they obviously need the transferable side as well. Um, the same argument about high frequency and uh, whether those words need to be taught or not. Um, again, that, that criticism applies with this list. And then quite a few people disagree with the idea of focusing on 
individual words rather than collocations. Um, and again, this does not look at collocations. It looks at just how does each word behave, which individual words are on this list. So for those who think we should be looking at chunks, two, three, four word chunks, again, that, that's not here in, in this list. So the next part um, I'd like to look at is if we're not going to look at just individual words, um, what arguably what collocations should we should we focus in on? A uh, lot of this comes uh, um, from Ken Highland, uh, and he looked at um, collocations, four word collocations in these four discipline areas: electronic engineering, biology, business studies, and applied linguistics. And uh, yeah, found that there were 50 most frequent sort of bundles, um, but only half are on, half are on one list only. Um, so he was arguing that these bundles are not transferable. Arguing um, a lot of his arguments are that we should be teaching specific um, to a discipline, not to an area that's transferable. So. Only five of these four-word bundles appear on all four of those subject areas. So saying when you look at the disciplines differently, then you need to actually choose different target language. And this is not sort of subject specific, as you see here, it's on the other hand, as well as the, in the case of the, at the same time, the results of the words that, or phrases rather than I think I personally would imagine were actually quite transferable. But when you look at it, they don't, a lot of them actually, they are the ones that do appear on all of this, but the other 45 don't. Um, what he looked at was the function of these collocations. So what were these collocations doing? And they were looking, they came into sort of three main categories. Sorry, I just realized this thing has scrolled away from me about, you know, okay. Um, yeah, they, looked, they fell into three main categories. So research orientated, so looking at things like location, procedure, quantification, description, and topic. These kind of chunks that we have here at the same time, the purpose of a wide range of the size of the, so looking at that sort of, sort of procedural type thing. Uh, another group of these collocations fell into text orientated chunks. By this, I mean kind of the language that manages the structure of the, the essay. And it's those things talking about transition, talking about results, framing things, it's expression like in the addition in addition to the it was found that in the next section, with the exception of the idea of the language that's orientating the reader around the text. The final category is the uh, participant orienta orientated. So that's where you're looking at stance, you know, the, the writer's position, the writer's sort of argument, um, and engaging with the, the reader. Um, so trying to pull the reader in, in a sense. Um, things like it's possible that, and as can be seen. And if you look in this table that we have here, um, you can see that they vary slightly between disciplines. So if we look down at the bottom there, um, in the sort of more social science side, applied linguistics and business studies, um, there's a lot more that are participant orientated, so a lot more of stance, a lot more of engagement, um, and a lot less of that in the, the science sides. Um, so he was arguing that uh, not only are the chunks different, but we need to give greater or, or less priority to different um, chunks or different functions depending on the discipline. Personally, I can see that there is a difference, but I, if you look at it, um, in, the, in the scientific ones, 90% is research or text orientated, and around 80-85% in the social sciences is research or text orientated. So obviously they do need to be given greater focus on the participant orientated ones in the social science, a huge amount is still, so that text orientation is above 40 but below 50 in both sort of discipline areas. Um, so it's kind of, it, it is an argument but I'm not sure that it, it's so convincing <laughs> um, that we can't say that, you know, okay, those four word chunks might not all be the same in the different areas but, you know, 80, sorry, 40 to 50% is actually 
text orientated for both of them. They might be using different words to orientate them around the text, but they're still orientating the reader around the text. Another um, argument that they make um, about um, dealing with collocation is that once you look at um, beyond the individual word, the accurate word, they have strategy, depending on where, which discipline you're in, it's more likely to collocate with one word or another, so marketing strategy, perhaps in business, learning strategy in perhaps uh, teaching, uh, and uh, coping strategy perhaps in psychology or something like that. So they, they behave differently once you get to collocation level. So they're saying that we should be teaching, again, discipline specific, really not transferable. Um, this next study, though, by Durant argues that we should be looking, we should be looking to um, create transferable collocations, and they did find a, a, a list in this piece of research with over a thousand two-word collocations that appeared across all five areas, whether it's life sciences, social science and engineering, social psychology. Uh, social administrative by business sort of areas, arts and humanities, that within these there were 1,000 two-word collocations that appeared across all five areas. So he, in this one they were arguing that even at collocation level um, you can create a transferable set. The interesting thing with this one was that uh, three quarters of the collocations are grammatical. So there'll be things, for example, like verb and preposition, um, or a verb and that, for example. So then you can see that these chunks perhaps play a particular function as well. So if we look at the reporting pattern, verb and that, then these 16 verbs here, um, argue, assume, conclude, etc. cetera, um, actually that with the word that, they, that structure is very common and those words are very common no matter what discipline area you're in. So that's something that we can focus in on and teach the, um, our students. Sorry, I can see some people are having problems with the connection. Um, the, yeah, the, the, sorry, the, the frequency at my end says it's good, so um, apologies if that is the case. There will be a recording to listen back to, so apologies if nothing's come up of this. I'm also going to try to um, uh, blog about this afterwards as well. Um, but yeah, as I say, so if you look back at frequency and the pattern combined here, um, I think there's something that we can focus in on and something useful we can teach students no matter what discipline they're in on. Yeah, these are some of the examples again, perhaps with uh, some prepositions like based on, associate with, relationship between. And I'll show you in a, a little bit. Um, these uh, students often um, admit words um, like prepositions of between and of, partly trying to avoid some of the sort of nominalization and noun sort of clauses, um, sticking more to the verb um, patterns. So yeah, if you, uh, the next part, looking at students' writing as a, um, compared to published materials. So what are students doing perhaps too often um, and what are students not doing often enough when they're compared to published materials? This comes uh, again from largely from um, the Academic Vocabulary and Learner Writing book I showed you earlier. And um, it was looking at the academic keyword list and which words were students overusing and which words or phrases were students underusing. Um, and they found that 50% of the academic keyword list was actually being underused by students um, in comparison to native speaker academic writing. So if you think about that, that's. Uh, as I said earlier, 97% of that list comes from the first 2,000 words and the academic word list, so they're quite high frequency. Um, but students are not actually using them a lot in their own writing. The words like basis, extent, assume, appropriate, these are words that students are not using as often as you would expect them to in comparison to native speaker academic English. Uh, there were ones that were also overused. So nearly just over 20% of the, the list was overused, things like aim, fact, main, all so often. So this rely, over-reliance on certain words on the list as well. Um, there was a tendency to amplify high frequency and diminish low, low ones. 
So to have words like idea and problem would be in their writing a lot. But words like hypothesis and conversely, even though they're on the list, they're less frequent and students are using them less frequently. So they're using words like idea and problem a lot, too much. Um, so many high frequency words were actually underused. Words like argument, significant, particularly were all underused by the learners. Um, and they particularly, as I mentioned before, they missed off a lot of prepositions. I missed out a comma as well. Um, so they missed off the prepositions a lot of between, in, by, and of. Um, what they're doing there is they're actually um, they're avoiding modifying the noun. Nouns are commonly modified afterwards um, with a prepositional phrase, and uh, it creates it's one of those sort of features that makes academic more to, well what we would recognise as academic writing. And students are avoiding doing that; they're avoiding modifying the noun, creating that larger sort of noun phrase, um, sticking to the sort of verb-driven side. Some other features that they found that students uh, didn't actually. Um, do as well as you would expect compared to native speakers. There was a lack of register awareness, um, sort of informality of tone. Um, personally, in my own context, I think some of this actually is an overhang from um, IELTS. Um, they're allowed to, I'm not sure how many of you have noticed the same problem, but um, they, they can argue very um, subjectively, very strong arguments, they don't have to hedge their opinion at all, um, they can be very personal and it doesn't, it doesn't really affect their marks. So um, and they, they, a lot of IELTS courses train, train them almost in that kind of, that style of writing, that more, more journalistic style almost. Another area that they um, have problems in is, is essentially chunking, again collocations, the clusters or sequences. There are some that they overuse such as, for example, more and more, the problem is that. And there are another number which are high frequency that they're underusing. So in particular, in terms of a considerable degree, these sort of chunks, they, they were not using as often as the native speakers were. With the next two kind of link, there can be semantic misuse of um, some language, such as on the contrary, can be quite often misused. But I think this next one I noticed quite a lot, um, chains of connective devices uh, littering their, their text, littering their essays, scattergun with just, you know, moreover, furthermore, in addition, um, constantly all over the place. And they, they overuse them in comparison to native speaker writing. In some ways, you can sort of see, see why, because it is something in a lot of courses that's given quite a high, high position, quite a high status. Um, so, they, you know, they, they, until recently, until a lot of the academic word list started to come out, that was one of the main language areas you found in a lot of EAP course books. So it's perhaps not surprising that students do overuse them, really. Okay, so the, the final section of the presentation, I'm going to look at vocabulary and reading. So what impact does the lack of vocabulary knowledge have on reading, but then also, what does reading do to improve your vocabulary? Sort of, uh, you can't really separate the the two. The, the first point actually came came partly from a talk I saw at the weekend um, when I was at the Barleap conference, the EAP conference. One presenter I saw argued that um, we shouldn't teach skills like skimming and scanning and predicting that um, students do these naturally in their own language. Um, so. They, they don't need to be taught them um, because they do them anyway. Um, I'm not entirely convinced by that. Um, I think in an academic situation, um, although they may naturally skim and scan perhaps, say when they're looking for a train timetable or something like that, um, I think a lot of my students are almost overwhelmed um, by the length and the density of text that they kind of forget these, um, these navigational sort of skills around the text. And although I don't think I'm teaching them, I think I'm uh, raising their awareness of the importance to use them. Yeah, they're often not aware of these strategies. Yeah, I think they're not, they, they're not aware of it often in that, in that academic context because a lot of students, depending on their age, I teach a lot of foundation students. Um, uh, and they, they, 
they haven't actually engaged with very dense academic texts before, and they're, they're over they're overwhelmed by them. And um, yeah, as you say in the chat box, there they feel the need to read and understand every word in the text, and they kind of almost forget to to read how they would in their own language. There is the argument that these skills and strategies are used by weak learners to cope. I know, for example, when I was living in Germany, I used to teach business English. And you'd go into a company and be waiting in reception, and I'd sit there trying to read the newspaper um, badly. And uh, you do rely on those strategies a lot, guessing, guessing words and using your background knowledge. Perhaps I saw the same thing on BBC World earlier. Um, I use it to help me pick apart the text and see if I can understand any of it. Um, but these, and then these skills are used, when they're used by a good learner, they're used to kind of enrich the meaning. If you can do these things naturally in a second language, if you can skim and scan and predict um, comfortably and confidently, then I think it enables you to engage in the way we want a lot of our students to engage with the text, uh, which is to think critically about them, to relate it to other things they've read in the field, to relate it to the wider discipline, the bigger picture. I think if you don't, if you haven't got all of those skills automatized, if you don't just do them naturally, then it becomes very, very difficult to engage critically with the content you, you've just read because you've gone through it so slowly um, because you were perhaps focusing in on the individual words um, that you don't actually, you can't really engage with the content because you're struggling to actually understand the content. So for me, I do think you do need the skills and strategies a little bit. Um, one thing I, I'm always wary of is there's a real uh, desire, basically, to I'd say to push students onto authentic texts very early, um, and sometimes I think too early. Um, if you look at the the frequency of vocabulary within an academic text, um, you do need a very very large vocabulary to be able to engage with it. And I think if students are pushed too quickly onto authentic texts that are beyond their level, it can have a really detrimental impact on their engagement with reading um, and their wider reading outside of the subject because they have the poor word recognition. If they don't recognize the words, they obviously don't comprehend the text. And if there's too many instances of that, then they avoid reading. They don't want to read because they find it incredibly challenging. Um, so I think it's kind of one of the things, when we were writing the lower levels of Skillful, we had actually created the text ourselves, which some people, that's just a big no, don't do it, use authentic text. But for me, I think it's, it's really important at this level that students are engaging and reading a lot. The more they read, the better. Because as the skills develop and the word recognition improves, then other things come into play, like the vocabulary, the background knowledge, and the complex structures. Um, but they need to actually start to recognize you know, the sound to sight, the pronunciation of the word. Um, it becomes a cycle, a downward spiral. If they're not reading enough, then they're not exposing themselves to enough language. Um, there are studies that say the sort of bulk of growth comes from um, indirect exposure rather than direct teaching. Um, so in that case, we do need to be getting them to to read a lot, really, you know, to build up their vocabulary. And reading rather than listening in particular as well. I'll show you on the, the next slide, um, slide is that there's actually hardly any, hardly any words used in speech in comparison to written texts. So if you look at this table here, it shows you the average frequency of the words in these different genres, so all written genres. So the average frequency of the word in the scientific abstract is at position 4,389 in terms of its frequency. Um, and even when you get down to preschool books, um, so you know under well under five in this country, well, really under four in this country, um, you you have 578 is the average frequency of those words. If you compare that to spoken English. Um, these are the average frequencies of the words in spoken English. So we've got popular primetime adult show here. The average frequency, 490. Only in an expert witness testimony does the frequency actually get anywhere near sort of a level that would become sort of pushing them and challenging them in terms of recognizing and understanding the words. Uh, if you if you look at uh, 
the ta if you look at the two tables, you can kind of say speech is lexically impoverished. Um, you think that children's books have considerably rarer words than most spoken forms. Adult books are twice as prolific as adult speech in you know prime time TV. Um, you know they're not actually being exposed to a huge amount of words um, when they're listening to English because we're not using the same rare words that we are in written forms. Just go back to the the reading one here. Even in comic books, you know, you're pushing towards 900 there. Um, that's twice the frequency, nearly twice the frequency of popular primetime adult TV shows. Median word, um, so the average, um, the average rank of the word. Um, so yeah, we do need to encourage our students and give them text that they're going to engage with them because they're much more likely to be exposed to less frequent words. But we need to scaffold it very well. We need to introduce it gradually and build up the level. Um, if you look at the, the rarity there of words outside the 10,000, yeah, it's nearly one in uh, one in 10 in a scientific abstract, um, but it's barely um, you know, 20 out of 1,000 in all forms of speech. We're exposing them to much, much rarer words when we expose them to written text than when we expose them to spoken language. So I would want to encourage my students to read as much as possible, hence the idea of giving them texts that have been graded and written for the level so that they feel they can engage it. They don't look at it and think, I have no idea what's going on here. Um, and then the downward spiral comes if they don't engage in reading, they don't expose themselves to vocabulary enough, and we have that cyclical nature of where they're not improving enough. We need to expose students, some studies say, to up 50 times to a word before they um, can actually fully understand and use it 50 times. <laughs> um, so they need to be doing a lot, a lot of reading. The number of words that are, the number of words that our learners need is sort of in debate for academics in English. Um, some studies have said that learners need around 3,000 words. Um, some have said as high as 10,000. Quite, quite a few put it around the 8 to 10,000 word bomb sort of mark to fully engage with an academic text. Um, and Laufer in 2000 found that a lot of undergraduate international students only actually had a vocabulary of between 1,000 and 2,000 words. So if they're needing nearly 8,000 words to fully engage with an academic text, a lot of them are miles away, um, or kilometers, wherever you are, um, the, from actually being able to properly understand that text, having enough words where all of these things become automatized. So you know that are, are, you can argue the AWL in the 2000. Is it really? Is it enough? Will it get you anywhere near the sort of 98% coverage um, that is argued that you need to fully understand the text? 98% coverage means you're, you're potentially needing up to about seven to nearly 8,000 words, um, a long way from where many of our learners are, unfortunately. So, yeah, in conclusion, I would say corpora I, I'm a big fan of. Um, I have an ongoing uh, uh, um, set of articles, actually, an English teaching professional. I don't know if any of you um, subscribe to that or have it in your schools, but it's gone for a year now where I'll be doing an article each edition um, on different corpora um, and on with activity sheets using those. And the one coming out, the first one comes out is the British National Court, but the second one is actually using the academic keyword list from uh, that I mentioned in this talk today. Um, I think when you choose your corporate, I think you need to select the list carefully to match your aims. You know, if you want to um, teach writing, arguably the academic keyword list is more important than the academic word list. Uh, the academic word list is arguably most valuable when you're getting to the point where students are perhaps of an upper intermediate level and are about to really engage with their academic community and their academic texts. I think it's incredibly important to pitch the text at the right level carefully, otherwise the, the negative effect that has on students reading enough and exposing themselves to enough language really impacts on their reading for me. And that balance between skills and language, balancing those carefully, I do think that we do need to teach the skills because I do think otherwise students tend to focus in on word by word recognition. Even though they can do it in their own language, not all successfully transfer that over to doing it in a second language. So 
I do think we need to teach those skills, but I do think we need to give greater priority often to language because the, the two go hand in hand. If you don't have enough words, you can't engage with the text, no matter how well you can skim scan through it. If there aren't enough words in there you understand, you won't, you won't get it. So as I say, this is sort of some of the theory that goes behind um, the creation of the skillful series. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions at all, um, I'll try and follow them in the automatized is basically they basically they do it automatically. Um, they, they, they don't have to think about it, it becomes second nature. Do you think it's particularly key, I think, in listening? Um, when you, you hear something, you, there's so much going on in your mind processing that language, and you do it in the first language, you do it just automatically. Um, but in the second language, it becomes quite hard to, to do. So carefully is the main common word. <laughs> have I used that carefully a lot? Have I? Sorry if I am denied a lot. Um, no. Nerves. <laughs> Did anybody have any questions at all? Did you get hold of this means? The presentation has been recorded. <laughs> I can watch myself back and see how much I really do. I'm enough. Um, and uh, it will be on the Macmillan website. The PowerPoint slides will bear with it. There is a, at the end of the um, presentation here, there is a bibliography, so you can sort of go and explore some of the, the literature as well. Free Corp, other than the British National Corp. If you go onto the University of Louvain's website, they list nearly 600 different corpora. Um, I'm not sure if I've got it on the bibliography. No, I'll, 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 when I uh, write up after this talk, I'll try and write a blog, I'll put it in there, but the University of Louvain have this database of over 600 corpora, some of which are free and some of which are not, but there's a whole, a whole list of them that you can sort of trawl through, um, some discipline specific, some focusing on learner, some focusing on um, published text, so there's a whole, whole range out there. The writer of the book I've shown earlier, that's um, the one at the top of this page um, on the bibliography that's displayed at the moment. Academic vocabulary and learner writing from extraction to analysis. Thank you. Uh, okay, great, thank you. Um, if there are any questions, and I, I think they'll probably put my email <laughs> with this as well, so if you do think of anything after this and you want to. Uh, Louvain, hang on, I'll just type it in the chat for you. Where is it? Yeah, Louvain. Um, and yeah, they've got, the, you can find the whole list of the 930 words on there as well, um, as well as, uh, like I say, a whole range of other corpora. Academic discourse and academic vocabulary. Yeah, a lot of people, um, sort of, it's difficult to separate out the, the two, isn't it? Which is why a lot of people argue for specialised lists for specialised disciplines, because they argue that the discourse patterns and discourse nature are different in different um, subject fields. Um, so I think probably when you're looking at academic discourse, I think you need to, the, the relationship, I think you very much need to look in the context of the genre you're going to to be studying in all the students you're teaching are in. There was a question, oh, sorry. I'm trying to scroll through and find them. It whizzes past very quickly with nearly 300 people. <laughs> okay, um, sorry if I missed your question at all. Um, are these books available? Where? The um, the series are available. I think you can buy them through sort of normal sites like Amazon and things, or the, uh, there would be a local sort of Macmillan rep would be as available as well. Um, if you look, the website gives you quite a few sample materials that you can look at for free. Um, MacmillanSkillful.com. And there's I think a, a spread for each page. Do you use Learner Corpora? This li the academic keyword list does use two Learner Corpora, it's two published Corpora and two Learner Corpora, which is where it's quite different from the academic word list, which was just published uh, materials in the Corpora. When you say reading is more useful than say listening, do you mean this is in the case of grammar translation or more? 
Uh, no, more useful just in the sense of um, the amount of vocabulary that you're exposed to. You're exposed to so much more vocabulary in reading than you are in um, spoken form. So just that terms of exposing yourself to less frequent words is more is more likely to occur in reading than it is in your listening to English. So I think that's where it is for me. How can we use a vocabulary knowledge of student? Any idea? Um, unfortunately, I, I was reading something about this. Um, Teaching vocabulary doesn't really help. So when your teacher is teaching you in the classroom, that doesn't actually help you too much um, to learn the words. Um, and I think, to be honest, you need the balance of exposure to the language. So learning it, sort of, not intentionally learning it, but inductively learning it. But also, then I think literally just sitting down there, intentionally learning it, using vocabulary cards, I think, is a great thing with students. Getting them to, you know, write example sentences, building the word family, building patterns of words related together. So, unfortunately, I think it's just hard work. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, levels of these books. The um, the yellow books are so, um, book two is intermediates kind of thing. Um, uh, B one basically. Um, and foundation is uh, is a sort of is firmly in the the A category of the Common European Framework. But yeah, if you say the intermediate is the yellow one, then pre and upper and advanced, and foundation is a sort of B, um, elementary. Which article is that? Sorry, I'm not sure what you're referring to there. The glossaries help. Yeah, I think they also help students learning the patterns as well, because a lot of glossaries have things like um, they, they define words not with relative clauses so often, but that post modifying with a preposition. So it gets students exposed to that pattern. That's very common there. What's the best way to study collocations for ourselves? Um, collocations, I think you, you just uh, you get a better sense of collocation from from reading, I think, because um, you can see how the collocation is used in the context. Like um, it said in the Highland one, um, collocations can behave differently in different disciplines. So seeing collocation in situ, I think, is one of the best ways. When studying history, to gloss yourself. Uh, no idea about specific sort of areas, I'm afraid. And you do have to make it worthwhile and interesting, definitely. Um, yeah, students are only going to engage if they actually enjoy the, the content um, the level and the enjoyment level. Um, helps, I think, really, doesn't it? OK, I think uh, I'll sign off for the um, afternoon now. Thank you very much for taking part. Um, and if you do have any um, questions, I think my email will be posted with uh, this. I'm now going to pass you back to Henry, I think, who might say a couple of words more about the certificates and things like that. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Thank you. Hello again, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Um, thanks to Lewis for a really interesting session. Um, I recognised a few of those phrases myself from my um, own uh, different university essays. So, yeah, it's very interesting, I thought. And um, I hope everybody managed to watch it OK. I know one or two of you had the odd problem with the slides, but don't worry, as I said at the start, um, the presentation is going to be made available on the website, and we'll email it to you as well. And there's a new feature now where um, our webinars are automatically uploaded to YouTube, too, uh, which gets around a few of the issues with uh, the Java that um, this uh, Blackboard system uses. So you should all be able to watch it again, and I know there's lots of stuff in there you'd like to see again. Um, right, I'm just here to talk about the certificate. Um, I'm posting a link now in the um, main chat room. Um, and if you click on that, you can go through and uh, download it. Um, but I'll also start a web tour now. Bear with me a second. And it should appear on the whiteboard shortly. Um, again, don't worry if you've got to shoot off. This will be made um, available for you. Right, it should have just appeared. And if you uh, go down and click Save, uh, you can obviously save it to your computer, print it off, and then you just need to um, add your name at the top and sign it yourself at the bottom. 
Uh, it's already signed by someone from Macmillan, so it's all good to go. I'll leave that up there for a few more seconds um, before um, I close the session for today. Um, let me know if you need it up there for any longer. Um, but like I said, this will come on the email and it'll be on the website too. Okay. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. It's very sunny here in London. It's a shame um, I can't show you right now, but um, take it from me, it is. And uh, we'll hopefully see you for our next webinar, which is in early May with Jill Budgel. Um, I'll be including the um, abstract and a few more details about that on the same email, which uh, you'll be sent shortly. Okay, uh, it's goodbye from me, and take care.